Hi, everybody. So um, I wanted to reintroduce myself since probably some of you haven't met me yet. I'm Bonnie Rose, and I'm the minister of an interfaith church just south of Santa Barbara. And I'm, I'm here and delighted to be here. Um, and I'm particularly delighted to be introducing my friend, Karma Lekshay Tsomo. She has a PhD in philosophy, and she's the author of several books. She's also a professor at the University of San Diego. When I asked Karma Lekshay what she wanted me to say about her, she said, tell them the fun stuff. <laughs> so I will let you know that she is a former surfer girl. She surfed Malibu in Hawaii. She was, in fact, captivated by Tibetan Buddhism on a surfing trip. She has also survived a toxic and poisonous viper bite. And she recently made kimchi with a master chef. <laughs> all of these things about Karma Lakshmi and all of the things that I don't have time to mention just give us great evidence of her will and her compassion. And I know that a lot of that she used in creating a nonprofit, the Jamyang Foundation, which is Himalayan, that provides educational opportunities to underserved women. I know also that many of us probably trust in our hearts that the healing of the world, that part of that depends on the education of women and providing them with opportunities. And so it's with great joy and great pleasure that I ask you to welcome Karma Lekshay Somo. Thank you very much. Aloha, everyone, and Tashi Dele. I think I'll stand here so I can see the slides. Yeah, so I'm very pleased to be here and to see all of you coming to discuss this important topic, what after mindfulness? I mean, will mindfulness really cure the disparities of the world? So the one disparity that I would like to address is the imbalance uh, between men and women. Um, the man-woman thing, <laughs> as Venerable Panyamati said this morning. Um, but not only the man-woman thing, because obviously it's more complicated than that. So gender, culture, and empowerment, this nexus, right? So in 20 minutes, I can't do oh, the whole history, but I'd like to uh, address some highlights. So we know that there are certain stereotypes in society about how women are supposed to be behave and speak and think even, and how men are supposed to behave and think and so on. So these stereotypes we learn from a very young age, perhaps even from the time we're in the womb. It begins, right, as our parents prepare the bassinet and the color scheme for us. Um, it's, there's also a lot of stereotypes about how we address life, how we prepare for life, what our roles are in society. Um, some of these stereotypes are really um, stark, and some are subtle. But we cannot say that we have not experienced sexism because it's all around us, right? So. Um, in different cultures, gender takes different forms, and gendered expectations of society also take different forms. That makes sense, but what does it really mean for women? For example, what does it mean for women when the archetype of human perfection is male, which is pretty much all world religions, right? These are questions. I'm going to raise questions because um, it's important that we think about these issues. Okay, and uh, in Hawaiian culture also, there are ideas about men and women's roles. Um, even to our physical needs, there are stereotypes and expectations. Um, again, how we wear our hair, right? How we speak, in what register we speak, what jokes we tell, how much we speak how loud we speak. Now, in, in collecting these signs from restrooms around the world, I've also found that sometimes there's a third option. But in many cases, the third option is disabled. Hmm. In one case, I found that the third option was an alien. Now, this is really interesting, because although it disrupts the gender binary, 
it's questionable about how it disrupts that binary. <laughs> now these days, we're getting more accustomed to the whatever um, restroom idea that everyone is welcome to use the restroom. <laughs> how revolutionary is that? Here I have to out myself as a Berkeley radical from the 1960s, so bear with me, please. <laughs> Um, now, I've come across this, these four ways of understanding gender, one which is gender essentialism, that men and women are basically different. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus, end of story. The second option is gender neutrality. Well, we're all just humans here. Slight, slightly different equipment, otherwise we're really basically the same. The third one, gender existentialism, is to say that yeah, we're basically the same, but society sends us different signals in response to which we behave in different ways and talk and, you know, develop our career plans according to what society expects of men, women, and perhaps others. And then gender fluidity, that we express gender differently from the time we are children until when we grow up until the end of life, we may express it differently in different situations, in different cultures, for example. I find myself, you know, when you speak Japanese, you have to speak as a woman. It's expected. You see, many languages do that. The little girl voice and so on. Very interesting. Right? So now these are just theories, but some uh, grid, some sort of um, way for us to start having this conversation. Now, um, let's talk about a third gender, a third option, too, because what we know now, although we thought we invented homosexuality, but no, it's been around for a very long time, and most of the famous Greek philosophers had boy lovers, and then got married and had children, right? So this isn't a new thing. Maybe the identification of oneself, I am gay, may be new, but homosexuality's been around probably since the beginning of time. Now, in Hawaiian culture, the in-between status is called mahu, and this is the same um, idea as in most Polynesian cultures. So most cultures do have a third option, or maybe a fourth or fifth option. Um, here, there's a new book on mahu that explains the history of this idea and the challenges that uh, the mahu community underwent with the importation of the colonial religious Christian ideology and, and different expectations. Um, so now attitudes are, are much more egalitarian and understanding. In India also, the community of the Hijira, uh, another in-between category. And here it uh, serves us well to understand that now they've discovered between one to three percent of human beings are born with indeterminate genitalia. And this became an issue, an ethical issue, um, in the popular perception when they realized it's an ethical issue to arbitrarily assign a human being a gender. What if they don't feel comfortable with that gender as they grow up? So um, the hijira are considered a separate caste. Um, they are born into, their, it's thought that they would belong to that caste if they, are, if they have indeterminate genitalia. But often the parents will just bribe them to go away, but sometimes they might give the child to the community. Uh, they do experience a lot of oppression, but uh, India has passed a law that now recognizes um, the right of same-sex unions, and they have, I think, the first TV commentator who was trans trans person, so uh, in some ways it's more progressive than we know. Um, in Native American cultures too, often there were four or five different genders depending on the nation, and so they were often regarded as special, as having special power and special communications with the other world. Um, some were shamans and some were so-called medicine men. Okay, in Indonesia too, we have the Wadia, who are transgendered, and they are often faithful Muslims. And how do they work that out in Indonesian society today? So there also there's a new film about the Wadia people too, if you'd like to learn more. And I just sort of thought these images were interesting too, because they challenge perhaps our notions of gender. 
you know, how do the Buddhists think about these things? Well, mostly they don't <laughs> think about them. But um, if they were to think about them, then they'd probably use the grid of the uh, five aggregates. You know, what composes the human person and break it down into these five aggregates. And I'll always remember Professor Lewis Lancaster who described this. He, he taught us these five aggregates here 50 years ago when I was in his class with a stick man, a stick person. Yeah, where he would illustrate the five aggregates using this um, illustration. And it's still, I still use it myself. Now, where does gender fall within these? Of course, in the form, we see the various sex differences. But do men and women and other people have different feelings? Are we emotionally different? Uh, what about our perceptions? Do they differ according to our sexual orientation or our gender identity? Hmm. What about mental formations? Now, this would allude to the imprints on our consciousness, the samskaras from lifetime after lifetime after lifetime, that might incline us to behave in certain manner. Say, what if we've been male for a hundred lifetimes? Then we come into this lifetime and draw a female body, but we still have inclinations to behave in certain ways, or vice versa, if we've been female for a hundred lifetimes, and then this time we draw a male form. It could also influence these imprints of our past experience might influence the way we behave or, yeah, act in this lifetime. And then consciousness. Now, the Buddhists are primarily concerned with consciousness and the transformation of consciousness. And last time I checked, there is no intrinsic difference between men and women and other categories in terms of consciousness. Consciousness is pure, clear knowing. Knowing and awareness, you can say, is the classical definition. So in this sense, since consciousness does not have genitalia at all, I mean, the concept is ridiculous, then we would have to say no. Oh, already time up? Well, okay, so I'm seeing there are images of fem enlightenment in female form, in, especially in the Mahayana tradition and in the Vajrayana tradition. Um, some of them very powerful uh, images, but we, in society itself, we see marked differences. Even the elevation where men and women sit in many Buddhist countries is very much defined hierarchically. And in many cases, the women practitioners, including women renunciates, do not get the support that they need or the education that they need or housing and so forth. Um, and often they carve out a, a situation in society, some um, definition, some identity that is, if they're not allowed to be fully ordained, they'll find a way. So this is Burma where they take eight precepts, sometimes nine or ten. Um, Sangha Mitra Day, how many minutes do we have? Five. Okay, good. Um, this is um, the, the stupa of Sangamitra, who you may remember was the one who took the lineage of full ordination from India to Sri Lanka, the daughter of Emperor Ashoka. And she is commemorated in Sri Lanka with a national holiday. As far as I know, she is the only woman who has a national holiday named after her in the world. So um, she, this community of fully ordained nuns has revived um, in the last few decades, which is quite remarkable. They've sort of set um, the trend in finding a way to establish coordination for women despite great opposition. And a lot of it has been through identifying male allies, both in the uh, ordained community and among the lay population. So um, in every Buddhist tradition, this is Vietnam, we find that women are very active participants in Buddhist temples. Without them, we don't know what would happen to the temples. Um, and full ordination does still exist in China, Korea, Taiwan, uh, Vietnam. There are over 30,000 fully ordained nuns in the world today. Um, and many more who are not recognized as fully ordained, and yet in Burma alone, there's said to be 60,000 nuns, renunciant women. So we're talking about large numbers here. Altogether, the estimated population of Buddhist women is somewhere between 300 and 600 million. 
Yeah, uh, unbelievable. But when I was saying 300 million, the Buddhists of China corrected me and said, no, we have 300 million in China alone. Oh, oh, thank you for correcting me. So, um, and we find that where women have full ordination, they also have more or less equal opportunities for education and they get great support from the lay community. So there seems to be a correlation there. Um, in the Tibetan tradition, for example, this is way up in the Indian Himalayas, you'll see on the right the men's monastery, fully endowed with fields and, and so many benefits. But the nuns community, you probably cannot even see because it's so small and they have no endowments and almost no support except now from outside so the area. So it shows that there's still on the ground great disparities between the nuns' communities and the monks' communities. I hope all of you are helping to correct that. These are the first three brave nuns who went from this area, Zanskar, to Tibet to receive the ten precepts of a novice nun and returned then to create the first nun monastery for nuns in that area, very remote area. Um, the, the current generation now is getting more education and a lot more support, so things are definitely changing. In the last 30 years, we've created a movement, a Buddhist mo movement around the world to help improve conditions for Buddhist women, and it's really working. I just returned from the uh, 16th Sakadita International Conference on Buddhist Women, and it's just remarkable. 800 women gathered from all over the world, um, and the, the quality of the discussions was so profound. Now, in the history of Buddhist women, first of all, we could say that without women, there would be no Buddha. Uh, there would be no Buddhist Buddhism in the world, right? That's pretty obvious. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um, here is um, Mahamaya giving birth to the prince Siddhartha who became the Buddha. And then we see also though some less positive images. You remember when the Buddha found his, his harem all lounging about, snoring and, and drooling, and it kind of turned him off. And pretty soon he decided to, to leave the palace and then went out and practiced austerities. And he broke his fast when offered uh, milk rice from a woman, Sujata. So women as nurturers is another theme within the Buddhist text. The, the texts are mixed, they give mixed messages, but here's a positive image of the nurturer. This is the Buddha's own stepmother and auntie Mahapajapati, who became the first bhikkhuni, the first fully ordained Buddhist nun. And we know that the Buddha taught audiences equally, men, women, of, people of all ages and all social and economic backgrounds. That's very important when we think about India. So he was something of a trailblazer and a social reformer, even if he didn't use those words. Um, here is Sangamita, uh, the daughter of Emperor Ashoka, taking uh, the bhikkhuni lineage to Sri Lanka and also the Bodhi tree, which is really significant in Sri Lankan Buddhist culture. So culture, religion, uh, and gender are really intertwined in these stories. And this is Hema. I, uh, it seems that she pinched the relic, the Buddha's tooth relic, and took it to Sri Lanka. So she's also um, commemorated for her good deed. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, and now here's some images of the Sakadita movement from the beginning. We focused on nuns the first time around because the situation of nuns at that time was really sad. Um, rather horrifying. So every two years we have a, a conference in a different country until the one in Australia, they've all been held in Asia, which makes sense because 99% of Buddhist women live in Asia, right? But of course now that other 1% is also very active. So Cambodia and Nepal, Taiwan, Korea, Malaysia, Mongolia, Vietnam, imagine the fun organizing a conference in a communist country. Yeah, uh, Thailand, Vaishali, the village where Mahabajapati became the first Buddhist nun, historically very important. Hong Kong, and this time Australia. So the next one I'm happy to announce will be in Sarawak, Borneo. 
uh, Eastern Malaysia, and they're all warmly invited to attend. It's open to men, women, uh, and in between, and everyone. Okay. So, education, and by many standards, things have improved inconceivably for women in the last, since we began our work in 87. So educational levels have increased. Women are now learning all of the ritual instruments, wearing the yellow robe, the yellow hat. Um, they're attending international conferences. Um, they're getting training in um, deportment. They're actually doing the cham, the ritual monastic so-called dance, or meditative movement. Um, they're even learning computers. <laughs> And they love it. So this next coming generation really is headed for greatness, both in spiritual matters and in all ways. Some will become meditators, some will become translators, some will become teachers. And this is really important for preserving Buddhist culture around the world. Um, some of these par uh, kids' parents have already converted to Hinduism because well, it's better funded, and they send teachers out and build huge temples, and it's very hard to get information about Buddhism. So I would encourage those of you who are inclined to teaching and don't mind, you know, a little slightly um, different living conditions to please help with this. Um, this is our monastery in Bodh Gaya. For 2,500 years, there was no monastery for women in Bodh Gaya. Excuse me? How can that be? And the most intriguing thing is that no one ever noticed. Yeah, well, now we have uh, a monastery for women. And it's quite a contrast to the multi-million dollar monasteries for monks, but we're happy. At least we have a space. Um, and we bring the nuns down from the Himalayas where it's too cold in the winter. It's covered by snow. There's not much to eat. There's no water these days. Huge water problems. And it's almost impossible to get teachers to go up to those areas. So for the winter months, then they come to Bodh Gaya and study there where it's comfortable and we can get teachers and there's plenty of food to eat. So uh, another landmark was two years ago when 20 Tibetan and Himalayan nuns took the Geshe degree, the highest degree in Buddhist philosophy for the first time in, in history. And they worked really hard on it. They studied for 20 to 30 years. And they were successful. And I can tell you it's not easy, especially under those living conditions. So, yay. <laughs> and they're happy campers. They're ready to go out and serve society now that they have the education to do so. So this is why the education piece is so highly important. Now, the last um, sort of border or boundary then is the full ordination issue. And it's a complicated one. It's not simply about sexism. It's also about monastic law. And so we've had to do a lot of catch up in terms of studying the Vinaya to figure out a way. But His Holiness the Dalai Lama is determined to find a way to resolve this inequality. Um, yeah, so he's asked us to convene conferences to discuss it, and we're working on it. So the future looks very bright for the young nuns and for Buddhist women around the world. Thank you to all of you, and especially to our male allies. We're very grateful for your kind support. Thank you. Thank you.